Welcome, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. We have Marcel Himscher from Free University Berlin. Marcel is a PhD student of Jens Eidert, and he specializes in, okay, has just two papers at the moment on archive, but very nice papers. One on, uh, let's say, some hardness arguments for Gaussian boson something. The other is this work that he'll be talking about today, so like learnability of output distributions of local quantum circuits. So maybe I would summarize as Marcel, let's say, is interested in mathematical aspects of near term quantum computers. Then, uh, yeah, like this is how I would summarize. So it's great to have you, Marcel. Uh, the, the screen is yours. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you for the uh, warm introduction. I think you've uh, nailed my interests down quite nicely. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, the learnability of the output distributions of local quantum circuits. And um, in case you're wondering, part of the contents of this uh, talk are already on the archive and parts of, of them are not and will hopefully soon be on the archive. So we're quite busy working uh, out the draft um, these days. And yeah, before uh, getting started, um, let me give credit to all the other people who were involved in, in this project and what I'm about to say. Um, it's uh, been a, quite a big pleasure to work um, in this uh, yeah, considerably large group of, of people, um, but I guess that um, I'm quite lucky to have so much input um, from so many sites. Um, okay, and now without um, further ado, uh, let me go ahead and um, start this talk properly. So this is, uh, we're starting quite basic. This is a quantum circuit or a picture of a quantum circuit rather, um, and um, it's representing a unitary U. And we all know that when the circuit is uh, measured in the computational basis, um, then the outcome of uh, the measurement is um, in general not deterministic, but rather probabilistically sampled according to some probability distribution that I've um, named PU here. And uh, the probabilities, the upper probabilities are given via the Born rule as this overlap here. And in particular, um, I will refer throughout this talk um, to such distributions as the output distributions of quantum circuits. And um, a particular emphasis uh, uh, will be given on um, circuits that have a geometric uh, constraint and that they are um, that neighboring qubits or gates are only acting maybe on nearest neighbor qubits. Um, so if you really want me to pin down the architecture that I'm talking about, then I would say I'm mostly talking about um, qubits on a line um, with nearest neighbor gates. And now these objects, these output distributions of quantum circuits have been studied in the um, quantum computation literature for quite a while. Um, in particular, there uh, they are of great interest in the field of classical simulation and um, the related field of um, maybe like demonstrating a quantum advantage through sampling experiments. And as uh, Michal, um, uh, when he introduced me, he told you uh, that I've sort of also thought about um, this field in the past a little bit in, in this context of boson sampling. But um, in this talk, um, uh, we are going to look at these output distributions from a different perspective. So not that of classical simulation, where you're sort of given the circuit and you're supposed to sample from the output. That's not the one, the perspective that we're going to take. The Rather, we're going to take a machine learning inspired perspective. Um, so this talk is going to be about learning from data. And so um, the basic scenario that we're considering throughout the talk is uh, depicted, on, depicted on the slide already. Um, there's some circuit U that's measured in the computational basis, and that gives rise to a set of um, samples x1 to xk, sort of compiled here in a list. Um, and these samples are given as input to a learning algorithm. And this learning algorithm 
um, it only has access to the samples x1 to xk, but no knowledge of the um, of the circuit u itself. So it doesn't know what gates are in the circuit or anything. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily know even that there is a circuit at all. It only sees um, the samples. And it's supposed to output a model for the underlying probability distribution PU. Um, that's the basic. That's the basic uh, setting that I'm that I want to consider. And now let me be uh, uh, let me relate this to um, what's usually or commonly the, uh, a problem in machine learning, uh, in particular unsupervised machine learning, where through some a stochastic process in real life and in nature. Um, we observe some data and we take that data as input to a learning problem. And uh, we make the implicit assumption that this data uh, was generated according to some underlying, underlying unknown probability distribution that characterizes the stochastic, stochastic process that um, generates this data. And now this, um, again, we, we want to have a learning algorithm that in some sense models uh, this input data. And uh, in particular, um, this sort of modeling might not only involve fitting the data well, um, but also generalizing to model the whole underlying probability distribution, which we don't know, but yeah, to model the distribution as a whole. So that's what we call generalization. And um, so far, I've been a bit loose when it comes to what I actually mean by model. So let me um, hopefully clarify that a little bit more in, on the next slide. So I basically want to distinguish between two types of um, uh, probabilistic models, namely density models and generative models. And density models, um, here the task is really to model the probability density function of the underlying distribution. So here I've put up, or tried to picked an example of what this might look like uh, for this 2D data points here, where you uh, might want to fit uh, a mixture of Gaussians, for example. And then this mixture model really is a representation of the probability density function uh, that might underlie this data. On the other hand, in generative modeling, the task is a bit uh, uh, more subtle, a bit different. Here, um, um, you actually, your model is uh, again an algorithm that is supposed to output new examples that look similar to the ones that um, uh, you see in your input data. So here in this example, um, I've taken uh, the facial images of my co-authors and, and now the task might be to um, produce, produce more of these images and, and uh, hopefully predict uh, the faces of future co-authors maybe. And yeah, but, but um, uh, this task is different in the sense that you want, really want an algorithm that produces new examples. You just, you're not only interested in, um, in the probability densities. And in the classical literature, there's a, a, a heap of um, uh, approaches to, to tackle such uh, a generative uh, modeling problem. In particular, um, I've put up some, some examples of, of models that uh, people have come up with. Uh, so far, uh, classical models. Uh, but like really, if you're if you're not super deep in in, in this field, um, it, it suffices to think about uh, a neural network at, at this point, which is really the, the prototypical approach of modern machine learning to to tackle the sort of um, generative modeling problem. And now, a recent development in the quantum machine learning literature is to come up with their own proposal that sort of mirrors uh, a neural network in a certain sense, um, where they've proposed to, instead of using the neural network, to just use the parameterized quantum circuit. And sort of similarly to neural networks, the, the idea here is that um, these gates in the circuit, um, they are trainable in the sense that they have some tunable parameters. And now through maybe a gradient-based uh, approach, you might want to uh, update uh, these parameters iteratively so that the output distribution of the circuit um, after training uh, fits the input data better and better. That's sort of this variational or hybrid quantum classical approach that um, is very uh, overwhelmingly common uh, these days in, in the quantum machine learning literature. 
And a moment of thought reveals that um, all distributions that you could ever want to express and, and uh, as the output distributions here. So in the class of distributions that you could actually ever hope to model in this way are exactly the output distributions of local quantum circuits. And in the quantum machine learning literature, to avoid confusion maybe with uh, in uh, those people who are very familiar with this, uh, these, this model class is referred to as the model class of Born machines. Um, right, and, and this, uh, this is uh, also so already the prime motivation, at least from a practical point of view, for what we are studying in our work. Namely, we're asking the question, uh, what is the potential of quantum circuits for generative modeling? And there are already some preliminary observations or on results on, on this front. For instance, it has been shown that the model class, these quantum circuit output distributions, they are actually quite expressive, which is a promising uh, property um, when uh, they're quite expressive when we compare them to these other known models that we have, uh, like graphical models, um, like these models that were just on the slide before, maybe. Um, so, Marissa, can I ask about this, this point? Yes, uh, please. So, uh, okay, like if, if you want to do gener generative modeling, like you, you somehow need to, is it, okay, I, I, let's say you, you observe some, let's say, empirical data that, that comes from some underlying distribution. And let's say fundamentally, there is no reason for the probability distribution to fit in the specific concept class, right? Sure. Uh, right. So, yes. so I guess all that let's say you are saying, like this, this, this first point, like is it referred to, like if I understand it, do I understand well that, let's say, if I fix let's say quantum neural network of specific size built from let's say local quantum gates, it's capable of let's say reproducing like modeling more uh, broader class of probability distributions now. Exactly, like so you fix, the sort of fix the number of parameters to be the same in both models. And then you compare um, at the fixed level number of parameters, how, like what's the variety of distributions that the one side can model versus the other. So exactly what okay. you just said. Okay, but is it only the, the num number wise or is it also like that one class is one class of models is contained in the other. Exactly, and, and so for oh, instance, okay. it's it's known that like hidden Markov models, they're sort of uh, contained ex in, inside quantum circuits. Thanks. When when the bond dimension and, and the corresponding dimension of the hidden Markov model are compared. So, yeah, right. Okay, yeah, feel free to ask questions. Like the last time uh, I gave this talk, I was, pretty time constrained and but I'm hopefully this is not so harsh today so I'm, I'm happy to take questions along the way at any point if there are any um, doubts or anything. Um, if that's not the case at the moment um, let me continue. So um, one observation is that um, is concerned with the expressiveness of these models and then an obvious uh, observation maybe is that once you're tr using a quantum circuit as, as a model and the circuit that, that you are training is not efficiently classically uh, simulatable, then in order to run this model um, to produce samples, you need a quantum computer in general. And, and this uh, observation has sort of sparked the question whether there could be some sort of quantum advantage here, just because um, you need the quantum computer to run the model. And the, uh, I mean, yeah, that might be a naive, um, <clears throat> a, a naive uh, view, but it's, I, th I guess it's not entirely uh, foolish. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but you might also think that these quantum models, um, they seem to be kind of complex. <clears throat> um, sorry. They are kind of maybe more complex than other models and conventional machine learning and wisdom is that um, making your model more complex is sometimes not a good idea because you might run into issues with training the model <clears throat> or overfitting. Um, 
if you have too many parameters, maybe. So yeah, it's, it's at the moment, I, I guess it's quite unclear the status of, of these models. And um, I think now um, I can, with this nice motivation from the practical point of view, I can sort of um, go on and present um, what we've actually done and what we contribute to this um, picture that I've um, put out there so far. So our work is um, quite theoretically uh, minded, I suppose, in, in the sense that we are relying on, on a framework uh, in computational learning theory that, uh, which is called the PAC model of learning, where PAC stands for probably approximately correct. And this uh, framework is very well established in computational learning theory uh, as a way to judge um, how computationally difficult it is to learn from data. And in this framework, um, the nice thing about it is that we can really make very rigorous um, claims about what's doable and what's not. And <clears throat> well, some people might argue that um, maybe this uh, formal framework is a bit too removed uh, from, from practice, um, as is unfortunately uh, really sometimes the case in machine learning. But I guess our results um, have a very meaningful um, thing to say about especially this, this last point here, of the point of um, being able to prove a quantum advantage. So it might be that uh, despite what we find, these, these models might still do well, but um, I think our results provide very strong arguments um, for whether you can or cannot prove a quantum advantage in these settings. All right, so let me actually uh, introduce this PAC uh, model of distribution learning to you so that you know what I'm talking about. Um, so what's on the slide so far, I, you've already seen, there's a training set that consists of um, samples um, that are independently sampled from an unknown distribution Q. And there's a learning algorithm that is supposed to take this training set as an input and output a model um, for the unknown distribution Q. And again, let me reiterate that I'm interested in these uh, two types of models, density models and generative uh, models likewise. Um, so algorithms that model the probabilities, uh, but also algorithms that are able to come up with new examples from the data they've seen. And in the PAC model- Sorry, model, I have a question. Yep. Why is XI outside of the... Oh, oh okay, I understand now. It was the annotational thingy. Okay, I, I understand. Uh, let me okay Sorry let me clear maybe no no let me clarify so there there k many samples and each of them is samples in sampled independently yeah, yeah, got from it, got q it, got it. thank you okay yeah uh, no no worries okay so there's one ingredient missing here that we need in the in our formal setting to even argue about what's doable or what's not and and this ingredient is the concept class so the concept class is just a subset of the set of all distributions and um, how does this now allow us to argue about whether learning is doable or not? Um, where the learning algorithm is promised that this unknown distribution Q here belongs to the subset, to this concept class. And in particular, um, usually the concept classes that we want to consider, um, all the distributions in there are supposed to have some uh, structure in common that the learning algorithm is then um, able to exploit in order to make learning feasible. So um, to, to relate back to what I've shown you so far, you can maybe think about uh, one particular example of a concept class that um, contains all distributions over um, facial images. Uh, and then you might, or the learning algorithm should be tailored uh, in the way that it really exploits that's only ever going to see images of faces as input and not images of landscapes. So in particular, when I think about a neural network, then I might dedicate some layers of this neural network to um, deal with the fact that facial images of humans um, have some features in common. And, and I might really want to uh, put this in by hand so that the learning algorithm does um, something with these images of the faces rather than images of, of landscapes maybe. So this is the this is the concept class. Next, uh, let me stress that throughout this talk, 
uh, we will only consider classical input data. Some of you might be familiar with the concept of um, quantum examples in, in quantum learning theory. Um, but uh, me and my co-authors, we think that this that quantum data as input in the distribution learning uh, setting is really not uh, very well motivated. And that's why we think that classical, uh, that's why we restrict ourselves to classical data as input. On the other hand, um, the learning algorithm and the model uh, it outputs, um, they can be both quantum or classical. Um, and we actually are interested in both of these and, and um, trying to understand if, if this distinction might make a difference or not um, for the task. Um, so, Marissa, can you just elaborate like how uh, quantum data can look here? Do you mean like output, like uh, outputs of quantum circuits, like states uh, resulting from application of a quantum circuit? Like, okay, in this specific uh, case that you want to study or? Yeah, I guess uh, I guess that's sort of that's sort of my point. It's even hard to imagine how you could model quantum access to a distribution. I guess um, you could you could um, consider something like a superposition example where uh, you have access to like some normalized version of of a superposition of of many samples at at once. And, and that's something that's very common in, in, in function PAC learning. Um, mm -hmm. But it, I don't think it, it makes sense in distribution learning. Because um, distributions, really, we, we don't want, in the end, when we actually want to apply this to, to a practical problem, we're not interested in, in modeling quantum distributions, but we're interested in using quantum circuits to model classical distributions. Sure, and, sure. And, right, OK. Good, and, and okay, um, there's another subtle point here. Um, actually, the learning algorithm shouldn't be required to output an exact uh, description of the model, but only an approximate one. Um, it's easy to see that in most cases from a finite number of samples, it would actually be impossible, impossible to model the right distribution exactly right. Um, and so uh, we allow the learning algorithm to, to be a little bit wrong uh, in, in some metric of, of distance in the space of distributions, where we take that to be the total variation distance, but uh, it could also be the KL divergence maybe. Um, I think that wouldn't change our, our results um, very much, but let's stick uh, with the total variation distance uh, for now. And lastly, um, uh, we want to judge uh, the hardness or easiness of, of the learning problem in, in some uh, metric and in this throughout this talk i will only uh, really judge this on the level of time complexity and in particular whenever i will say or write that something is hard i will mean that it uh, takes super polynomial runtime but let me note that um, in learning theory a common other metric is to judge uh, the hardness uh, by means of the number of samples that is required, that is the sample complexity. But our results so far, um, or we, so far we don't have uh, a lot to say in that regard. And I think it's something that I am definitely very interested in also thinking about in the future. Um, right, so that's the distribution learning uh, framework abstractly set out, um, maybe too abstractly. So let me give uh, quickly give an example so that we can wrap our head around this framework. Um, a bit more. So consider the problem of learning product distributions over n bit strings. So these bit strings here, I've called them x, and each bit is a b. Uh, so the x is a, a concatenation of bit one, bit, bit two, and so on and so forth. And uh, we're considering the set of all distributions that is product over these individual bits. And um, I, I hope. Uh, that you already have an idea of how, how one could uh, solve this learning problem. So the input data is going to look something like that, just bit strings here. But now we know that each of this bit string uh, uh, actually comes from an underlying product distribution. That is, um, I think of that usually as, as a bunch of n coins where each of these coins has a bias. 
and these coins are thrown independently and that's the process through which the samples are generated and now the learning problem boils down to just uh, estimating the bias of each of these coins individually and and you can just empirically estimate uh, this bias by, by taking the estimate of, of one of these columns here and and so to summarize this learning problem of learning product distributions over n bit strings is really the same as the problem of learning biases of n independent coins and that can be done efficiently both uh, in time and 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 samples and with this uh, uh, i hope um, that with this uh, example out of the way we are now well on our way to understand um, the actual concept class that we have studied in our work which are the output distributions of local quantum circuits so if you look at, at this image of the quantum circuit here on the left um, and, and you think about this for a while, then you realize that um, this concept class actually has two natural parameters uh, that comes comes uh, yeah, that come in in hand with this. Namely, one parameter is the gate set. Um, so each of these two qubit gates that are depicted here uh, is taken from some gate set, and it's sort of uh, hopefully intuitive that especially if, if we are considering a restricted gate set that is not universal, then also the output distributions um, that might ever come out of, of a circuit that only has gates of this restricted gate set, these output distributions will also usually come with some additional structure or some additional limitations. So that's a natural parameter co to consider. And the other natural parameter is uh, the depth. So again, hopefully intuitively, uh, a clear um, um, it's hopefully intuitively clear that when once the uh, you increase the depth of a, a quantum circuit more and more um, it, it's sort of able to model a richer variety of, of distributions uh, with increasing depth and in particular I, I've uh, put up two extremes here so uh, consider a circuit that was cut off here after the first layer and has only depth one and it should be clear uh, that all distributions that uh, could ever be modeled with such uh, depth one circuits are all product distributions. They're not product of uh, individual bits, but maybe pairs of bits now because I'm depicted to two qubit gates, but still they are product. And in this case, uh, learning is easy. But in the infinite depth limit, when we allow the circuits in our circuit class uh, to have infinite depth and we also consider a universal gate set then these circuits uh, themselves are able to approximate um, any unitary on the whole unitary group um, arbit to arbitrary precision and, and that means that also the distributions coming out um, will um, saturate to be the set of all distributions over the domain and then there's nothing to exploit for the learning algorithm and, and learning must be hard in this case. And, and I've, my motivation for putting up these two extreme regimes here is sort of to, to suggest to you already that hopefully somewhere in between there's a transition from easy to hard and it's now only our job to nail down exactly where this transition happens. Um, right, so to summarize, we have these two uh, parameters, gate set and depth. And uh, now let me present our results in, in order. So we have, we have considered both of these sort of in, independently and, and some results on, on both fronts and also a lot of uh, gaps and, and open questions in, in both uh, cases. Um, so yeah, let's, let's just start um, with the circuit class slash gate set. So I guess uh, intuitively um, when we uh, interesting classes of circuits uh, to consider are a subuniversal circuit class because circuit classes because usually these come with additional structure and additional structure is some is good for a learning algorithm because it means that we have have some additional handle on on how to actually build this algorithm or come up with an idea of of what it could exploit and so as i said we we've sort of studied depth and circuit class independently 
So here we really think about the depth just being polynomial for the moment in the number of qubits, so not really restricted at all. And so maybe uh, and some examples of, of, uh, of circle classes that I find interesting also in this context. Um, I mean, I come originally from, from this quantum advantage uh, sampling stuff and all the examples that I've put here also come from this literature. But that's basically because uh, um, there is additional structure known in the output distributions. And I think that's also interesting in the learning um, setting likewise. So hopefully, maybe in the future, um, I and others, uh, my uh, co collaborators are able to also maybe say something about these for the moment. And what we've done in the paper so far is concerned with Clifford circuits. and. Another motivation to, uh, or maybe the same motivation, is, is to understand. In, in uh, I have a question. Oh, should I go back on the slide? Yeah, yeah, or... please. Okay. So, just a simple question. So, you're saying that uh, boson sampling uh, has a sub universal, uh, is a sub universal circuit class. So, that means that it, can, it is not a complete set, right? So, is there any proof for that? Yes, I, th I think so. Uh, the unitaries in, if I think about the unitary group in, in boson sampling, it's uh, it's the unitary group that is restricted to the one particle uh, subspace of the full bosonic Hilbert space, mm -hmm. uh, rather than the full unitary group on all the full bosonic Hilbert space. And I think that that argument should be enough to tell you that this can't be universal at all. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, thanks. Can I just comment on, on this? Because just, uh, it's, okay, so I, I mean, it's uh, kind of strongly believed, but like, uh, I, I guess it depends in, in what sense universal, because it can, it's sure. not excluded if, because it, it might be possible that some final post-processing uh, of outputs can, would give you answer to problems in BQP, so like universal yes. quantum computation. Mm -hmm. And this is, I guess, an open problem. Uh, although, I mean, people, I guess, ex expect that it's not universal for some uh, kind of for sampling for the, for the reason that yes. Marcel. Mentioned. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks. Yes, I, I agree. Uh, I agree completely. Um, yeah, I've, I've also in the past spent some time thinking about how you could actually post process uh, samples, but I've never come up with anything, anything there. I think it's very opaque on like how such a post processing procedure should look like, but it, that's a different, different topic. I, I mean, like if one doesn't put any constraints, you can put, you can get anything there, right? So it's right. Tricky. Okay. Yeah. It should be efficient in some way. Yeah. yeah. Right. <clears throat> I mean, in the worst case, you can just ignore whatever the out output was produced and start a computation from from scratch. Yeah. Okay. So let's Thank get you. back to to the topic um, at hand. And so another motivation for why it's interesting to study uh, restricted classes of circuits or also gate sets um, is to understand and how far learning and simulating. Um, learning output distributions and, and simulating, um, classically simulating them, um, how, these, how the complexity of these two tasks compares. And, and in particular, I guess my current belief is that learning is pro in some, some sense a bit uh, harder in most cases because it's a reconstruction problem. Um, but uh, I guess it's open to, to find out um, and yeah, I'll give you an example of, of, of a result that we can prove that has something to say in, in this regard. Um, so for completeness, uh, consider Clifford circuits um, of depth. It's, it's enough to consider the Clifford circuits of linear depth because uh, linear depth was shown to be sufficient to implement our Clifford unitaries. Um, so consider such circuits and consider the set of output distributions. And now we ask about the hardness or easiness of the distribution learning problem in this PAC framework, uh, PAC learning framework. And um, 
Before I get to the results, let me quickly show you that in other settings where Clifford circuits or stabilizer states have played a role, and, um, and I, must, I must say in other learning settings, it, it was sort of suggested that the same structure that makes Clifford a circuit simulation easy also often helps when it comes to learning tasks. So the same stabilizer formalism um, can uh, often be uh, or is, was used in all these works that I've put up here to also show that learning in, in other settings um, can be done efficiently. And even if you mix in a few gates, that's um, there are some preliminary results on adding a few T gates um, in, in other learning settings. And it's been shown that uh, in, in cer under certain conditions, there's, there's a smooth transition in the number of T gates in the complexity of, of learning. And in our setting, we find the following in the distribution um, learning sorry, setting. So can I ask, uh, like, what are those other learning settings? Just if you can just briefly comment, like, how they differ from from the pack framework. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the first one I've I've put here is state slash circuit learning. So here, so for instance, consider the task of learning a stabilizer state. So um, and you. And the setting now only differs from ours in the sense that the input um, they allow is an arbitrary measurement on, on the state. So in the sense that's sort of a, a tomographic task, if you want, it turns out that, that really uh, there's a preferred class of measurements, namely either Bell basis measurements or Pauli basis measurements that, that are sufficient to do this job. But uh, in principle, in, in the top section here, the, the measurements can be arbitrary and the task is just to recover the state. And the state, because it's a stabilizer state, it's known to have an e efficient classical representation and that's what you want to. Okay, so you have kind of broader access to your object because you don't only, it's not only about probability, just, you don't access just via measurements in a computational basis, but exactly. you can do a few uh like measurements of your choice essentially exactly so in okay. the sense is you have greater access but you also asked a bit more in the sense that you're asked to reproduce the full state and not just the projection on on the computational basis sure yeah. sure but okay it's uh yeah uh yeah, yeah. Right, but I, I guess what, what makes our, our work uh, interesting coming from this literature is sort of this, this different sort of access, uh, this restricted access to the data that we have in our, in our setting. And, and then in the Aronson, I think that the Aronson PAC learning framework is a bit, even a bit more subtle. Here there's, there's a distribution over measurements. In that case here, it's, it's a distribution over Pauli measurements. And your task is to perform well, with respect to that distribution. Um, so yeah. is it a fixed distribution or uh, sort of? Mm. Uh... Both are fine. You, he, like Aronson himself, uh, similar to the distribution independent PAC standard framework for functions, he considers uh, learning with respect to any distribution. But for instance, here in this work, it's, uh, this uh, work shows that uh, stabilizer states can be learned efficiently for uh, under any distribution of our Pauli measurements, so no other measurements. And okay, so, and this distribution is is known a priori, let's say, it's a parameter of the problem. Mm, it's it's not known to you, no. It's not known to the algorithm, but here in this case, in this in this sense, it's known that there's some distribution over only over okay, Pauli okay, measurements, but, but not which one. I see, but you like in a given, sorry, I understand that a specific access to your state is that there is some underlying probability distribution that is gonna, that is deciding which measurement is You're being seeing. implemented. Yes. You know which measurement was implemented and then the task of the learner is to post process the data based on the samples that he or she got and uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, let's say which measurement setting was kind of carried out. Uh, yes. Okay, that's okay, correct. Thanks. That's correct. Okay, this slide uh, was, uh, its purpose was to come back to the talk, its purpose was to really uh, suggest that in other settings, learning and simulation, uh, when it comes to Clifford 
objects is, is sort of uh, aligned in complexity so far. And so just, just like uh, comments. So I mean, I, I kept asking those technical questions because it's, it's just okay. Some stuff that okay. Is, those are just some names I I was not aware of, and it's it's like for some let's say some some results that we have on like you know learning fermionic unitaries. They are like okay in the they are in the form of let's say the state circuit learning, for example. Right, I guess that is the first I didn't sense. know this name, so it's good to know names. <laughs> sure, sure. Yes, I think I'm, I'm mildly aware of, of this work you just uh, said on the fermions. Uh, and I, yeah, it's, I guess you're correct in the sense that it's in this first setting here. Um, all right, so turning back to distribution learning, uh, consider the Clifford uh, set of Clifford circuit output distributions, and we find that in both the generative and the density modeling sense, this task is uh, efficiently doable. And um, I have a bit more time in this talk, so I can quickly sketch uh, why this is efficiently doable. So it's a known fact that the output distribution of a Clifford circuit is uniform over an affine subspace of uh, this vector space, uh, n-dimensional vector space over a finite field of two elements, which uh, I've denoted by F2n. Um, so it's, it's, it's known that all such distributions must be uniform over such a fine subspaces. And that's a lot of structure, uh, much more than you, than you need probably. But in this case, uh, we can just interpret uh, the input, uh, the samples that we get as vectors coming from this uh, vector space. And then by using Gaussian elimination, we can quickly find a linearly independent set that is the basis for this vector space uh, A. And once we have the vector space A, the problem is basically solved. So there's a very simple learning algorithm here that does the job. And yeah, um, if you, yeah, for further details, yeah, you can either ask me now or refer to the, to the paper that's already out. Um, yeah. Um, now, we make a very curious observation um, in, in, the, in, our, in, a work, in the paper that's not out yet, namely that if we add a single T gate uh, into the mix, so if we allow Clifford circuits with a single T gate, then in the generative case at the moment, uh, we don't have a clue what's the complexity of the learning problem. But in the density modeling case, uh, we find that the task becomes hard immediately. Uh, with the single T gate, and that's sort of curious because uh, let me let me maybe first uh, sketch wh why why where this hardness comes from. Um, so I just told you that Clifford circuit output distributions are uniform over subspaces, and if you now add the T gate in, um, you get as output distribution something that is uh, a mixture of subspaces, and this problem has actually been considered in, in a nice paper uh, that I've linked or like put up here below, where it's the task of learning a mixture of two subspaces over finite fields. And in this paper, it's sort of this paper, I guess, gives the deep, uh, gives a sort of a deep reason for why this task becomes hard, namely that in, in certain settings, when, when the subspaces are such that they are the one is, is, is contained in the other. This problem reduces to learning to parity with noise, which is uh, believed to be a hard uh, problem. And there are cryptographic schemes uh, built upon um, the complexity of this problem. And, and that's also the reduction that we use or, yeah, in the paper that's about to come out and um, to show that in this density modeling sense, this, this problem is uh, conditionally hard uh, even with a single T-gate. Uh, but yeah, I'd be very happy to also resolve this uh, uh, generative case setting here. Yeah, that would be very nice, I guess. Um, um, can I ask Marcel uh, just about like formal definition of this uh, density modeling? So do you- uh, You want an algorithm that, out, uh, that is able to output probabilities uh, when you give an X as input? Mm -hmm. Uh, I see. So it's not uh, even a not necessarily a strong uh, simulator, right? Uh, so it's, it doesn't uh, need just... to no marginal. It's just the output probability. I see. I see. 
Uh, sure. Yep. Yep. Um, good. Yeah, and I, I, I guess uh, coming back to my my uh, pictures here. Um, um, so in the Clifford, just Clifford setting, uh, learning and simulation, the complexity was aligned, aligned, and at least in the density uh, modeling setting, with the addition of the uh, T gate, we find that the complexity is now skewed towards learning, and that is because it's known that simulating Clifford circuits with a single T gate. Uh, can be done in polynomial time. Um, in case you're not so familiar with the classical simulation literature, um, uh, Clifford circuits plus T gates are universal, but only once the T count, that is the number of T gates, becomes polynomial. And, and so for, for uh, small numbers of T gates, the simulation is still perfectly possible. Um, yeah, good. That's everything I, I had to say. In regard to, to the dependence of uh, the hardness of the learning problem uh, when it comes to gate sets. And now I'd, I'd like to tell you something about the dependence uh, on the depth. And so in, in, in the following, we consider uh, circuits of, with universal gate sets, but now we vary uh, sort of the depth or try to find results that, that tell us something about how hard uh, things are uh, when we allow those circuits to have a certain depth. And um, let me just uh, go ahead and give the first um, result that we find. Um, so distribution learning, these general circuits coming from universal gate sets um, uh, is hard uh, in both generative and density modeling sense whenever the depth is, is polynomial basically in, in the number of qubits. And, and this, um, this result is conditional on the existence of pseudo random functions. And the proof is basically copied or taken almost analogously from a 90s paper by Kearns and co authors, where they show the same thing for classical circuits. And the idea is just that you embed, that you can embed into these circuits a pseudo random function. And then uh, the learning algorithm, both the generator, generative learning algorithm, as well as the density modeling algorithm, they would both, if they existed, they would both contradict the pseudo-random property of the pseudo-random function. And, and so you get this contradictory result. And the depth uh, that we find here sort of is the depth that's necessary to, to embed this pseudo-random function. So that's where we get the depth from. Um, and yeah, let me note that the, at the moment, um, we're quite clueless uh, how one could, using this idea of pseudo embedding pseudo random function, how one could ever prove that such a bound is uh, tight. And I guess um, my strong belief is that this bound is nowhere near tight. And we're at the moment, uh, well, I would be very happy if we were to find a, a better proof technique here um, to get this depth dependence down much more. In the meantime, um, if you can't uh, prove uh, hardness uh, in the general case in, in computer science, then uh, it's sometimes a good idea to just uh, prove it uh, under some assumptions. And uh, a common scheme uh, in learning theory is to just re restrict the types of learning algorithms that you want uh, um, to allow to use. And, and that's what we will. All, that's like the last result that I'm go to, going to show you is, is, of this, um, is of this type where we now really strict the learning algorithm to get a stronger result. And I've put here some common restrictions on learning algorithms that have appeared on the liter in the literature. So you can restrict learning algorithms in, in a multitude of, of ways. You can consider adaptive versus non-adaptive ones. You, can, you, you might want to... Um, have the algorithm should maybe have some robustness uh, against uh, corrupted examples or it should operate uh, with a limited amount of memory. And, and the, the sort of restriction we are considering in our work here now is, is uh, a, a restriction on the way that the algorithm can access the data. And, and let me clarify that hopefully in, in the next slide. 
So the types of algorithms that we, we, that we are considering are called statistical query algorithms. And they have limited access on the data in the sense that they only access the data via statistical averages. Okay, let me depict for you how, how this differs from the general setting. Um, so here on the left is, is the general setting. There's the um, underlying unknown probability distribution and the input um, to the algorithm looks like this, uh, where I just get a, a bunch of bit strings, which are the examples. And in the statistical, in this restricted restrict statistical query model, we only consider algorithms um, that access the data via averages over, over these samples. So these algorithms, they are not actually allowed to see the samples themselves. They, only, they can only see averages with respect to them. And a bit more formally, maybe, um, here on the left, these algorithms, they did, as I said before, they get the list of examples. But the statistical query algorithms, and their way to access the data is to send. Uh, so that's a very that's the former setting that we're operating in. But it, um, yeah, it, it sort of models what I've just told you. These, the learning algorithm now sends some function uh, of the domain and it, it gets access to the data. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's now revealed the average of this function with respect to the data. And it's, it only gets the average approximately. But really, um, that's, that's formal. And uh, the way that you should think about it is really this. On this left side, in the general case, you see all the samples individually. And, and statistical query algorithms, they only see average with respect to the samples. But they can ask for whatever average they want, basically. OK. So and the idea is now that these algorithms here on the right, they are in some sense restricted. But they are restricted in a nice way that lets us prove uh, uh, stronger results. And, and they have additionally additional other nice properties. So they are known to be robust against uh, uh, corruptions of the data, basically because they're, on, because they're only relying on averages with respect to the data. It, it doesn't really matter to these algorithms that, algorithms that much if there's some um, corruption in, in some fraction of the examples. Um, as I said before, they are pretty, uh, that means beautiful techniques for showing law, law bounds um, that involve so-called statistical dimensions. And these algorithms, uh, I can hopefully convince you that they're also extremely relevant. So we're not restricting ourselves uh, here to a class of very contrived algorithms, but rather most of these and uh, most of the known learning algorithms are actually SQ algorithms, um, in particular gradient-based uh, training methods are in 99% of the cases uh, are there in this SQ uh, model. And um, yeah, I've also written here that SQ algorithms are, we view them as sort of generic algorithms in the sense that um, you don't really need to, these algorithms, they don't really rely on the structure of the problem that much. You can always, for any uh, modeling problem, you can sort of apply a moment matching technique where you just try to match some moments uh, with respect to the samples that you're seeing. And in the sense that they are, these algorithms are sort of a one size fits all solution to, to a bunch of very different problems. Um, and thus come and be applied. Okay, so, um, in so this can I just uh, just comment for people just to maybe connect with the things that people do like on, in, in in practice. So like just sometimes you are okay. I'm, I'm just gonna rephrase what you just said if you allow me. Mm -hmm. So like rather than looking on individual samples, you uh, let's say in the, the, those learning algorithms they okay you can imagine that you from samples you as like in practice you estimate uh, a bunch of expectation values of some observables, right? Like, or some simple functions of data. And you, let's say your your algorithm is just taking as input to, like those expectation values that, I guess, I mean, it's a mathematical abstraction of, abstraction of this, right? But that's- yes. The, yeah. yes, right. It's a mathematical abstraction of, of, of this, right? And, and in this, uh, maybe 
to even give, give a better example, uh, the product distribution learner that I've presented before is of, of this kind, it, but the Clifford distribution learner is not specifically not a statistical query learner because in order to do this Gaussian elimination step, you have to interpret individual samples as uh, uh, like uh, belonging to some system of linear equations and that wouldn't be possible in this, in this SQ model. Okay, in this restricted model, we can show a better result. Namely, we can get the steps dependence here uh, down by quite a bit, um, which I'm, I, I, so this is a result that I really like also because it's, uh, it's fun proving uh, stuff in this, in this model. And yeah, let me just read it out. Distribution learning, general circuits of depth, um, small omega of log n from statistical queries is hard in both the generative and the density modeling sense. So even these uh, shorter depth circuits are hard in this framework. And, and we currently view this as evidence uh, um, for, for a potential of bringing also this bluely depicted bound here down at least to the same level. But that would be in the general uh, a setting where we don't really know how to, to improve the, the bounds so far. Okay, and that brings me to the end of my talk. Let me summarize uh, sort of the results that we had. We had some results that depended on the circuit class uh, slash gate set, and we had some results that depended on the depth. And in both cases, um, there are some gaps to fill, hopefully, but also, um, in, we are currently working on bringing uh, these results closer to what's done in the QML uh, realm, basically to, to the heuristics that are already used. And, and we want to do that by pushing our results from a worst case uh, setting into an average case setting. And in the SQ model, uh, I, I think we have a very good handle on things. Um, so far and hopefully can, can present some future work uh, soon. And I think also a nice avenue for future exploration is to, to consider different circuit classes, uh, not just Clifford's. I think um, Clifford's are nice, and but there, there's more there. And um, finally, uh, there is, there's a problem that I really, it's, it's sort of my nemesis, a little bit, I, um, in the sense that I, I think it's it's crazy that uh, so far in this large group of people, we haven't we have not even come up with an algorithm that learns these super shallow circuit output distributions where you really just want to learn output distributions of uh, constant depth circuits, and that's something that so far we haven't been able to do. And I think, uh, yeah, I would be surprised if that's not possible, and I'm. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're very much looking forward to continuing working on that front. Um, yeah, that was my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, yeah, hopefully oh, I can ask more. You can ask more questions and if you want to. <laughs> uh, thanks, Marissa, for a great talk. Uh, yes, we have time for questions, comments. Uh, I asked a few, so I hope Maybe some <laughs> uh, some other people. Uh, yes, if I may. Please, yeah. Sure. Uh, so, what about robustness uh, with noise of, of those results? Can you tolerate some noise on the gates? Yeah, that's a good question. So, in uh, let me my answer is twofold. In the Clifford setting, noise. Uh, um, is sort of like a little bit like adding a T gate. Like if, if you have noise on the gates, then that pushes you out of the Clifford realm. And, and any, it's sort of known that any like Clifford plus anything non Clifford sort of starts becoming universal. And I guess we are, yeah, we are basically convinced that the, the same uh, thing as is down here in, in the T case will happen then. Um, in the general setting, uh, I'm not sure about the noise. Uh, I mean, then 
you're sort of sampling from a mixed state and I, I haven't really thought about this uh, that much. Uh, but yeah, at least for like uh, uh, incoherent noise. Not sure about coherent noise either. I guess that wouldn't really change our results because that would still be just a different unitary. Yeah, I hope that. So I like, yeah. can, can I just comment about this thing you said about that, that noise puts you away from uh, Cleafords? And of, of course, like this is true, but I mean, you can imagine the following model you will have, let's say, Pauli or the polarizing noise whenever mm -hmm. you implement some Clifford, let's say, local Clifford gates. And then you you are formally ending up in, let's say, convex hull, right? Of uh, uh, Yeah, depending yeah on how deep the circuit is, I guess, yeah, then you're pushed to, you're pushed to maximally mixed state somehow. And yeah, of course, in that limit, everything is easy again. But I guess it also depends That's a little bit on how easy. It, it depends on how what you what you what you want your algorithm to do. Usually, in in these noisy settings, the task is to still recover the unnoisy version uh -huh. of the state, and that of course uh, becomes even harder uh, in the noise uh, when you add noise. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and and it's known that like again, learning parity with noise is then sort of again, I guess the in the Clifford setting the the way to argue that that noise destroys you and, and it makes this hard quite quickly. Yeah. Um, what if you have uh, just noise just upon the measurement, let's say, uh, just some noisy, you know, like some noisy, I mean, just noisy samples. I, I mean, just, uh, you know, you have some, let's say, local stochastic map in between the outputs that you observe. Right mm -hmm. uh, and the let's say ideal outputs of the uh, so this is by the way it might sound artificial but it's a uh, good uh, good heuristic for the readout noise that actually occurs in uh, in devices. So if I understand you like you you flip the the bit the classical bit with some probability at the end yeah. right. Yeah, I, but that's still parity with noise actually so it still mm -hmm. still would be hard. Yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, if I may add something. So I think uh, noise can be thought in terms of these unitaries too, right? So if they fall, uh, I mean, if you can make them up using these unitaries, right? Then it will be basically the same. I mean, the result would still hold, right? Right. Yeah. Especially like in this universal setting, definitely. Like it, Okay, I, I'm not sure if I understand what, what are the, you mean the hardness would hold uh, or uh, uh, like the hardness of learning. Yeah, I mean, the results would still hold, right? Result for hardness of the circuit still holds. Mm -hmm. Okay, like, I, okay, I don't fully, okay, I, I don't fully understand, like, it, maybe it might depend on the model of noise that you have, because like formally, surely, okay, surely. I'm not, yes expert on, on this, but like formally just your concept, uh, like using the, the the lingo that Marcel introduced, like the concept class can sort of change, changes, yes. say. So it's, uh, it's not that it's, uh, I guess if it was a super class, I guess by the, like if your cl concept class is just larger, then uh, it's easy to argue something like this. But if it's right. just different, then uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think the assumption should be that the concept class uh, contains every sort of distribution, right? Yes. And then, yeah, so. Uh, right, so I'm, I mean, if you- sure, like, but like imagine, imagine, okay, this is, okay, this is maybe more like a phys philosophical discussion, but imagine you have those <laughs> noisy computers when the gate, gate fidelities are, you know, you don't, you're not in the four tolerant regime and uh, gate fidelities are, let's say, Point, uh, I know, point five percent or something, right? Or like some fraction of a percent, but it, let's say fixed, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say it's the polarizing noise. Mm -hmm. uh, that is really a different uh, concept class, right? Like if you have like such a, for example, such a simple model, right? Because that, I mean, I, I'm let's say we are. I, I guess that this problem is motivated by 
or like this line of inquiry by Marcel and Marius and others is motivated by, but what quantum computers are supposed to be, let's say, useful for, right? And uh, I, mm -hmm. and uh, let's say if, so, uh, yeah, okay, but this is just a comment. I mean, what I understand is but you are trying to say that the uh, concept class are different for different problems. That's what you're trying to say, right? So for quantum computer, the concept class is itself different. That's what are well, you saying? I, I just said that the concept class for noisy quantum computer can be just different. Okay, okay. That's, uh, you know, I mean, and it, it, it's, it makes sense to consider like a class that con contains noises, quantum computers, and some noisy quantum, like uh, noises quantum circuits and noisy quantum circuits. <laughs> I mean, but then hardest results kind of prevail, I guess, <laughs> trivially. At but least then, in the worst case, yeah. Uh, yeah, but then like if you just restrict to the to noisy circuits for some mm -hmm. mode of noise, it's not obvious. I mean, I'm, it's not a critic. Uh, I'm not criticizing. I'm just yeah. I'm also not an expert, so I was just I mean trying to put my understanding. Sure. So, yeah. Okay. Some some other questions to to Marcel. Uh, so. Pum, pum, pum. Uh, uh, okay, I wanted. So, uh, okay, one, one question that you mentioned is SQ setting. Uh, so, uh, are Clifford circuits learnable in this SQ? No. 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 Ah, so, this is like a counter kind of, kind of uh, counter argument to this evidence for uh, hardness that you have for. Shall, uh, Shallow, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's in in some sense it is, and in some sense it it's not. I, I guess our mot our motivation for say, saying that it's it's can be taken as evidence for hardness really applies to the universal gate set, where it's not clear to us at the moment uh, mm -hmm. how how looking at individual samples should help in such a setting where. At least to me, there's no obvious structure in the output distribution of just the universal uh, circuit. But of course, in the Clifford, uh, in the Cliffords, there is. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, this the this SQ proof. Uh, um, right, it shows us that Cliffords are not SQ learnable. Uh, in fact, and yeah, you're right that it's sort of yeah, one has to be careful with with these sure. statements. So just one one question about the, those shallow circuits, because you you uh, universal. You you mentioned that you uh, you focus on one D architecture, mm -hmm. right? So there is, I mean, there is some, yeah, there is some structure there, namely like a sort of light, you know, light light cone type of structure. I mean, like uh, there is like. Uh, I mean, okay, maybe just uh, like there is like if you have some output bits, what happens to them just depends on the on their let's say shadow like past shadow in the circuit, sure. so to say. So this yes. is some uh, uh, and when you have I guess sublinear depth, it will be non-trivial. This uh, uh, this past cone. Yes. I mean, okay, yeah. it's always non trivial, but it will be sort of, it will just see a fragment of a, of a system, right? Right. So this is some structure, I guess, that one. Yes, we have, we have tried uh, very hard okay. to, un to, to use light cone arguments, but mm -hmm. somehow it, even it, at this very like constant depth, something that happens is that, um, even though bits might not be directly correlated. So, I mean, okay, mm -hmm. by this light cone argument in the, in the constant depth circuits, far away bits, they can't be correlated. That means like expectation value over x1, x2 uh, uh, factorizes uh, if mm -hmm. x1 is far away from x2. But yeah. something that still can happen is, is what's called conditional uh, dependence. So, conditionally on some outcome happening in the bulk, uh, you can then get a correlation between two far away bits, even though they are, they are not correlated uh, directly. 
and that's something that's very hard to overcome sort of in in, in the reconstruction mm -hmm. i see i see um okay one more question so so i guess one, one should view those uh, hardness results for learning as sort of no go like a no go results for uh possible quantum advantage i mean this is one perspective for, on looking at it like a no go for quantum advantage that uh, for setups that use this uh, this type of parametric okay let's say I'm to, let's say for universal circles, let's say parametric mm -hmm. uh, circles. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but like then um, one can, it's cons just, uh, it's okay. Uh, like, does it make sense to, to kind of to open box a little bit? I mean, like those are after all channels, not like unit, those are unit uh, circuits. Uh, right, not only, um, uh, I mean, yeah, let's say there are circuits and you can, one can imagine sort of putting in different, let's say, I mean, different input, but even classical inputs there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe this uh, could help, I don't know, or like change the game. So I mean like, okay, it's impossible to learn, like if you just have how to super abilities, but if you just put different, uh, you know, different input, maybe you can uh, learn the circuit, I mean. Yes, there, yeah, I agree. Um, it's not something that we have, uh, yeah, looked at so far, but I think it's, you're right that um, if, if the input was more flexible, more stuff could be possible, I guess, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, very inspiring talk. Uh, some, okay, last chance uh, to ask yeah. something yeah. to Marcel. One question. Ask. Yeah, so uh, uh, just one question. So in this slide, you can see a red box. So, uh, I mean, if you just repeat this red box, right, does it change the concept class? If you just repeat this. I mean, box. basically, I want to increase the depth of the circuit by repeating a certain set or a part of the circuit, similar to what you do in deep neural network because there is a universality result there, right? So, right, yeah, so it, it does, have, it does uh, you have change the concept class. Okay. It changes the concept class, yes. There are hopefully, like, if you have, if you're not, or if you don't have only like um, identity gates or something here, yeah, sure, and then, sure. then you, have a, you have just more distributions in the concept class. Okay, thanks. Cool, all right. So I guess it's time to finish and okay let's thank marissa for, for for a very nice presentation and thank you for having me discussion